What's going on? Back again. Welcome aboard to the Q&A series and this is the third episode. So like I mentioned previous episodes, every 14th and 28th of the month I'll be having a Q&A episode where I'll be answering 10 to 15 questions. And if you want to have your question in the next Q&A episode, simply put in the comment section below or you could DM to me on Instagram if you want to be more anonymous. But we got a really nice batch of questions today and I'm super excited to be answering them. So we're just going to jump right into it. So the first question on the list is we got Mexvin who wants to know, okay, maybe an odd one, but do you think heavy overhead snatch grip holds set up in a rack with pins very high are good for traps? I think that heavy overhead snatch grip shrugs more in particular might be a little bit better because you can actually get a range of motion. I know Omar Yusuf made a video in the past about overhead shrugs. If you look at a lot of the weight, Olympic weightlifters, they're doing snatch grip overhead holds, at least as assistance lifts, or if they're not, they're still doing it in the training due to the competition exercise. When you have a heavy snatch over your head, even if it's not on for that much time, you still get great tension in the traps. So you could actually try it out for yourself. You could be seated, you could be standing, you could do like a behind the neck push press and then just have it in place. You could do a overhead carry with it. If you have a high enough ceiling and if your gym has enough room for you to walk around with a barbell over your head, but it might just be a little experiment you could try and just see how your traps feel. But one thing's for sure, if you wanna get more tension in the traps, you'd benefit from doing it with snatch grip and you could play around with it. You could be stationary, you have shrugs in it, or you could walk around and have that isometric hold. As far as time and retention is concerned, I wouldn't be doing this for anything less than 30 seconds. So I would do sets of one to two minutes or low rest periods and let me know how it feels for your trap development. So Legend27 wants to know, for RDLs, I've been going slow down and up fast with some isometric mix in it. Is that the best way to get a huge lactic acid spike in the hamstrings? Thanks. I personally like doing RDLs with a three to five second eccentric. The pause is optional and then you just come back up. So right now, for example, in my cycle, I'm doing some uh, semi snatch grip RDLs, four second eccentric with no pause. So you just go slow on the way down and then you just launch it all the way up. And I really feel it very well in my hamstrings. So you can play around with different things. It's like, it has to suit, you have to try certain things out. I, mean, I was gonna say suit your psychological profile, but forget about that. You have to try certain things out. And once again, don't lose the idea of the big pictures. They have to get a lot stronger. So you could do all these little, you know, these tempos, pauses, all these different programming modifications. But at the end of the day, for example, if you're doing like 225 in your RDL for sets of 10, and a couple of years later, you're still doing 225, not much is going to happen with your hamstring development. So it's nice to look at the little details in the programming, but overall you have to get stronger. You have to get that 225 RDL to at least 315 for at least a dozen reps. You really want to see something in your hamstrings. You really want to see a difference. So hope that helps. So Sashin Lalwani wants to know, at what rate do you recommend bulking to minimize fat gain? And at what rate do you recommend cutting to minimize muscle loss? So if we're talking about actually minimizing fat gain as much as possible, then it's not going to be an aggressive bulk. It's going to be maybe 2 3% at the absolute most, maybe 4 for certain people. And as far as the cutting concern, it's not going to be too much of an aggressive cut either because you don't want to lose too much muscle. So I don't like to throw absolutes in the mix, but I would say as a general rule of thumb, I wouldn't recommend, I would not recommend bulking over 20% body fat. And unless if you're competing in bodybuilding, I wouldn't recommend going under 10% either. I don't think there's really any point, especially if you're saying if you want to minimize muscle loss, if you go below 10% body fat, you're going to lose a good amount of muscle. You will lose some fat as well, obviously, but you are going to lose some muscle. So, and also on the other hand, I don't recommend most people bulking over 20% body fat, but it all depends. You know, there's a lot of heavyweight athletes, a lot of, you know, hockey players, strong man competitors who are way well above 20% body fat. So it all depends on the circumstances, all depends what your sport is, how serious are you about winning? Because at the end of the day, if you're competing in something like strong man, you don't, you don't get extra bounty points if one guy is 23% body fat and he won, but the other guy is 21 and a half. So it's like, you kind of have to weigh out the pros and cons. 
But just to answer this question on a different level, I would say find what works for you. As vague as it sounds, I know for myself, I don't like to go past 20% body fat and I'm definitely not going to go below 10% either. So I'm living on the higher teen levels, but that's just me personally. You might find for yourself that you might want to just stay at a certain range. You might want to be at 15% body fat or maybe you're one of those people who want to bulk and cut. You want to be at a slightly different weight year round. So in that case, maybe if you're normally around 15, you go on a mini bulk like I just mentioned below before you get to 17. If you want to get on a cut, go from 15 to like 13 or maybe even 12. So Bark Ruffalo wants to know, I've been fasting since Ramadan started and I have not been going to the gym since COVID-19. I will also not be able to go to the gym for another month because of exams. However, I have been focusing on calisthenics, volume and skill work. Do you think this is enough to maintain the gains I had made prior to Ramadan starting? Okay, it's hard to, for me to answer because I don't know what your gains look like before Ramadan started. But if you're telling me that you only have calisthenics, volume and skill work at your disposal, you have to make sure that you're really hammering the volume and getting stronger so you can try to maintain as much muscle as possible. So for example, if before the Ramadan started, if you were doing, for example, 10 pull-ups and now you still have access to calisthenics, try to get that 10 pull-ups to around 15. Try to get the 15 to 20 or however strong you can get on this exercise because it's gonna make sure that it's going to ensure that you're getting stronger, you're gonna be building more muscle in that area. So you can, might have, you might actually be able to build muscle during this time frame if you're using the right variations with the tools that you have disposable for you at the time right now. But as far as the lower body is concerned, it's gonna be very hard to maintain that because calisthenics and skill work, skill work has a lot of balance in it. It's hard to maintain lower body size off of body weight training. I don't care what anybody tells you. Pistol squats, you know, glute hammers are great, but overall, especially for the quads, it's very hard to maintain size. So I wouldn't be surprised if you lose a lot of lower body size and upper back size, like in the traps, but you could still build other areas as well. You know, dips, get a weight vest, weighted pull-ups, handstand push-ups, work up to one-arm variations of inverted rows and one-arm chin-ups and you should still put on a decent amount of muscle in this time period. What's your opinion on gymnastic rings? Do you think they could build huge biceps like everyone claims? I think this is really dependent on how far you are in your lifting journey. For example, if you've been lifting for one year, that's different if you've been lifting for like a decade or so, and you have a lot of strength on your belt, you spend a lot of time under the bar, and your strength level is just through the roof. If you're at that point, you probably built the majority of your muscle and I think that if you just start using gymnastic rings at that point I don't think it's going to make the biggest difference because you've already built the majority of your muscle as opposed to if you've only been lifting for let's say one year and you're using gymnastic rings of course they're gonna be great for biceps because your whole body needs to grow so it really depends on your expertise level how far you are in the lifting game but I've seen a couple of lifters online on the natural side who have definitely reported back with some great gains for their biceps by doing some gymnastic chin-ups. And the reason why is because one of the functions of the bicep is to bring the pinky in. And if you just take your pinky right now and you bring it towards the thumb level, you're already gonna feel more of a contraction in the biceps. And that's actually what happens more on a deeper level when you start doing gymnastic type exercises. You could feel a better contraction, you could feel better pump, your mind-muscle connection improves when you do gymnastics type exercises. So give it a try for yourself. Get your numbers up on the gymnastic lifts, particularly in the pulling movements. So for example, you could do some supinated grip, inverted rows, work up to doing some, maybe some assisted one-arm chin-ups, work up to higher rep chin-ups, and let me know how that goes for your bicep development. Space.yoga wants to know on Instagram, hey mate, do you use fat grips and a fat bar, Saxon bar for your workouts? Benefits you feel using these? Thanks. So I personally don't use a Saxon bar, but I'm assuming you're talking about Arthur Saxon. It's probably like a thick bar that he may have used. I personally don't use that and I don't even know where I could get one to be honest, but as far as fat grips are concerned, I've used them more in the past for like, you know, hammer curls. I've tried them on farmer's walks, wasn't too crazy about it. I feel like fat grips are a great tool to have, but on certain exercises, they kind of defeat the purpose. Like if you do a fat, fat grip farmer walk, 
your traps are not going to give out. It's really just your grip's going to give out. So it really turns everything to a real like, grip exercise. And if forms are really a high priority for you, then definitely go at it. But you can get way more bang for your buck from a farmer walk by just holding on to the thinner handle because then you get the upper back benefits. Your grip's not going to give out as soon. And I'm personally, myself, trying out and trying to see what works better for my form growth. Is it hammer curls without the fat grip or hammer curls with the fat grip? Because I find that when I have the fat grip on, it's more about holding the bar. And I feel like my brachioradialis and different muscles in my forms aren't really giving out as much as my actual grip strength. So there's a difference between your grip strength and actual form hypertrophy. That could be a different video altogether. But to answer your question, I'm not really using fat bars that much. I was doing more zercher lifts in the past, for example. And I was using the axle bar for that. But I'm personally not doing many searches right now. I'm on the front squat wave, front squat cycles, and just front rack in general. So hope that answers your question. It depends on the goal. If forms and grip strength is really your go-to, if it's really your priority right now, then you would definitely benefit from having more fat grips in. But if you're trying to build up your back, you're trying to build up different muscles in your body, and your grip strength is not the number one priority, you could really skip on the fat grips, at least for now. So first of the north side wants to know any more collabs with Alpha Destiny coming up. I've been enjoying both of your content lately. I've been receiving this question from a couple different people before I even announced the Q&A. The answer to that is of course they're going to be collabing. We're obviously talking on a regular basis. Nothing has really changed, but we're just kind of on different paths as far as business is concerned. I have certain projects in mind. I have my vision towards those things, but we will definitely collab in the future. That's not even a question, but... Um, still watching his content, he's still watching mine, we're still exchanging ideas, we're still talking about, you know, training philosophies and stuff of that nature, we're still talking, but we're just taking a little bit of a break from the content, I'm just focusing on my own kind of stuff, and I'm kind of taking it a bit more easy on the collabs until a bit later on, so stay tuned. So Maestro Codes wants to know, has your opinion on partials changed over the years? Apologies if you've already spoken about this recently. So I've spoken about it a couple years ago, but it's okay because I'm bringing it right back to the surface. I think partials have their place. But with that being said, you have to understand that everything from partials to drop sets to time sets to arm wraps, all these things are literally just tools in the toolbox. So if you guys look at my wall right here, see all these tools, there's certain tools that I might not even use myself for a while, but I know I have them at my disposal. The same thing can be said about partials. I don't personally use many partials myself, but I know that they're in the back side of my pocket. I know that whatever the case is, if somebody has certain limitations or mobility, flexibility restrictions, that could be an option. So a perfect example of that is if I have, for example, a client who doesn't have the, a good amount of mobility to get down in the position of a low handle trap bar deadlift, we could simply use a high handle for now. And then as the cycle goes on, we could probably put like a block under or like, you know, a, a board. And then over time, as we sort things out, as we address certain weaknesses and imbalances, asymmetries, flexibility issues, all that kind of stuff, then we could gradually bring it down. But at the surface, on the first uh, day, for example, it might be a high handle. I might even have, for example, someone who's, you know, six foot six, who doesn't have the best, greatest mobility in the world. And even the high handle trap bar deadlift might even still be a bit low for them. So you could even elevate that off a slight board. And in many people's books, that is considered uh, partial. But with that being said, use the right tool for the right job. So it's like, it's a very loaded question, even though it's very short. The answer to this is that it really depends on the individual, it depends on what the goals are, what kind of sport are they competing for, or what kind of goals they have in general, what kind of limitations they're working with. And this could vary from muscle to muscle. They may not have, they may not require certain partial lifts for certain muscles, then maybe for a quad exercise, it might be a partial. So it really depends on the individual, but I hope that answers your question. Orlando wants to know what are your favorite GBP exercises and how would you program them into your training? Should GBP get its own day? So for all you don't know what GBP is, it stands for general physical preparedness. It's basically a fancy way of saying conditioning. And as far as my conditioning is concerned, my favorite lifts at the moment are the sandbag carry and the farmer's walk. And I also like the one arm farmer walk as well for like getting the QL. But those are my personal favorite. And should GBP get its own day? 
from what I personally found is that when people have all their training days and they have a GPP day, they're most likely going to half-ass it, skip it, or all the above. So what I like to do instead is just have GBP at the end of the session. So at the bare minimum, let's say you're running up or lower, at the bare minimum have GBP at the end of your lower body days. So at least you're getting twice a week, which is what I'm personally doing right now. I'm actually not doing GBP at the end of my upper body sessions, but the lower body, yes. But in the ideal world, let's say you're doing like an upper lower routine, just have like 10, 15, at least 15 minutes of general physical preparedness, so some conditioning at the end of each session. And you could vary it. For example, in a more ideal situation, you would have more of a lower body conditioning exercise at the end of a lower body day. So something like you do a whole lower body session and you have something like a sled drag to really like hammer the quads. Or for example, you have your upper body day and you finish off with like a sandbag carry to really like toast the upper back. So hope that answers your question. So Joaquim Garcia wants to know great tips. Thanks. I have a question. If I'm on an upper lower split and I hit my upper back with your tips on lower body, this will affect recuperation for traps and upper back in general, or will it carry over like nucleus overload for it? Pretty sure I'll answer this in the last Q and A, but your upper back and your traps can handle so much more volume and frequency than you think. Like they recover fast. It's not like the lower back. The lower back is a bit of a different story, but the upper back is different. So you could do, for example, uh, an upper body day, have a ton of rows, have a ton of pull-ups, face pulls, shrugs. And then on your lower body day, you have like, deadlifting variations like RDLs, you can have the trap bar deadlift. You can finish off with some farmer walks, it'll still be fine, but you have to gradually work up to it and start off with lighter loads and eventually work your way up. Arif Khalil wants to know on your video on how to program conditioning, sandbag, dumbbell carries, one minute work, one minute rest for 10 minutes at the end of each session, workout is viable. Can you give us a generic template to follow? Thanks for the videos, brother. I love them. Peace. So I can give you a complicated answer, but what I'm going to say is check out this video right here and also check out the rest of the conditioning playlist. It's going to help you more than enough, way beyond the scope of this video. So based Abdu wants to know best long head tricep exercises. Okay, so when it comes to the tricep long head, you guys already know, the OGs of this channel know that I've been trying to develop this particular muscle for so many years. And what I've personally found is overhead extension variations, but not ones where you're just wobbly, you don't have like upper back support. You wanna be locked into the position. So you don't wanna be standing up either. You wanna be seated. You want your upper back to be against some kind of pad. So what I like to do is get into a squat rack. So for example, let's say you get on an incline bench the incline bench is high, so the dumbbell is going to hit it when you pull back. So what you could do instead is get in a rack, put a bench down on the ground, and then you could just put a bar against your back. So I'm going to post a video right here so you can understand what I'm talking about. And it's super simple to understand, but that way the, the bar is not going to get in the way of the dumbbell like a bench will. So you could really get a nice stretch in the tricep long head. And you want to do one arm versions and two arm versions. And a lot of people complain about how it feels like a behind the neck press when they do this exercise. That's why the simple solution is to get more out of less weight. So that's why I like uh, to change my tempo on these for longevity. And it just feels better for the tricep long hit overall anyway. So I like a five second eccentric and a five second pause on my overhead extensions work. So give that a shot and work up to some good weights. If you're doing, for example, a nice little standard is if you could do 45 pounds and up, on overhead extension with that tempo I'm talking about for at least 10 reps, your arms are gonna be a lot bigger. Okay, so Miles Crow wants to know, what is the meaning of life? So this is definitely the kind of question I was expecting from Miles, but I'll try my best to answer it. And keep in mind that my opinion on this is changing year after year. And this could be arguably one of the most loaded questions on this channel and in this whole Q&A series. I could talk about this for hours on end. And we've actually spoken about this for of decent amount of time as well. So as far as right now is concerned, my personal meaning of life is broken down into two words. It's experience and navigation. And the whole experience is because there's so much stuff that we have to experience. And you can only learn so much by just looking at a screen or reading a book. You have to go out there and do it yourself. You could look at somebody else's trip to a certain country, but you don't really know what it feels like until you've been there. Or you could look at certain people's foods online, but you have to experience that food for yourself. And there's such a wide variety, such a wide variety of exercises, such a wide variety of everything. And 
that's what life is all about. It's about experiencing things. It's about optimism, looking forward to the future, having projects in play. And then as far as the navigation is concerned, it's trying to navigate through everything because life isn't like a linear line where everything is just progressing at a linear fashion. You know, it's going to be really like zigzag. There's going to be a lot of pitfalls. There's going to be a lot of spikes up. It's kind of like the stock market, you know, and it's just about trying to navigate through it. You know, it's like you're on a boat and you just go a couple miles one way only to see like a big iceberg and then you have to go different ways only to find out that it's just complicated overall, you know, but overall it's just about experience, about navigation. It's just about going through it, you know, embracing the pain, embracing the good moments, understanding that you're not going to appreciate the bad moments, or should I say the good moments if it wasn't for the bad moments. Like for example, my power went out this morning and it really made me appreciate the light when it came back on. Same thing can be said about life. You know, you have all these down moments, but then one day things start clicking together and you start getting momentum back and now you're on the right track and it feels good. And if you never had those bad moments, you would never have appreciated the good moments if it was just good the whole time. So that's my current take on life right now. Jox wants to know, how come you don't monetize your videos anymore? Super simple question with a super simple answer. I don't want any distractions. I want to build a better connection with you guys. And if I have, for example, a 12 minute video and I put ads on it, there's going to be a video playing every like two minutes or so. So we're looking at a good five ads. And nowadays the ads are getting even longer. So it just makes the video so much longer than it has to be because that 12 minute video will now turn to like a 13 or 14 minute video. And I don't want to waste your time. So I want to give you guys the value, give you the content. I want you guys to get the information to point A to point Z. And the only commercials I want on my channel are going to be my own commercials that I make. And I'll most likely just throw them in at the end of the video. So when you're actually done watching the video, then you can continue to the commercial. And if you want to work with me one on one, then that's what I'll do instead, as opposed to like working with the commercials and the AdSense. It's not really worth it for me. I want to just build a better connection with you guys and build the community up. And I don't feel like having commercials playing every two minutes is really going to help me do that. All right, so there you guys have it. That wraps up Q&A part three. Let me know in the comment section below what your questions are for part four on the 14th of May. So I really enjoyed answering these kind of questions and hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll see you guys soon.